Yeah, no problem. Um, so cool. We are recording. Welcome to sorry. Uh, I think we're starting this recording about 10 minutes late. Sorry, we got a little involved in some conversation, but um, this is the Helio working group for uh, May 16th. And um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna hop in. I've shared the uh, meeting notes to the chat. So Daniel or Hayden, go ahead and add on there if you have anything you want to add. Um, I'm going to ping Alex and see if he can join. Um, uh, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. And then do, 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 do. Yeah. So I think something important to call out here is this issue that you ran into, Daniel. I put this on the thing first, and then I just saw before this meeting that you had like investigated and found the fix and closed it. Um, but yeah, inside of C Code Pen, yeah. Hayden wants to demo. For sure. Hayden, do I? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, so inside of CodePen, which when you add a dependency, it automatically uses esm.sh and, um, no, I, I just actually added an import with a dynamic, with like a dynamic import using an esmsh, but oh. I'm not sure if that's the default behavior or anything. I tried, I added as a dependency and then it used esm.sh. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So I don't know if that's because of the dependency, uh, because the dependency is you know, like ESM and it like determines that before it figures out which one to use. But, but, um, but yeah, apparently, uh, you need to pass a bundle depths query option, um, in order for it to work properly. So, which makes sense but also is not super intuitive when you first kind of hop on <laughs> uh, it didn't pen. really make sense to me but i mean like it, it it wasn't a good explanation for why the behavior was so different when it wasn't bundled but i just tried it out i was like okay this is working cool um modules and i find just module and dependency management in just JS world has become hell just because of the common JS ESM legacy and just like mm -hmm. dynamic imports are now supported. I, it's all necessary, but everything is just so fucking bloody difficult. Yeah, it looks like we can add a uh, bundle true to ESM.sh, but maybe maybe they're reading the side effects false and then like code splitting. On esm.sh, I'm not sure exactly why they would do that, but um, we will probably run into this in the future, and we'll need to like know if somebody's importing via esm.sh that like, hey, they need to like pass the bundle depths. Um, but yeah, without bundle depths, what do you, you just have to know all of the things to import? <laughs> Um, so that's... you can actually look at it if you open up the URL, for example, the one that I just dropped, like the ESMSH one, I dropped it in the chat. Yeah. So it's like, basically what it does is from what I understand when the browser sees this, it starts going and like fetching each one of the dependencies individ individually. Um, and that way, I guess it can leverage a bit more caching. Anyways, the context for this, um, Alex, just because you look a bit uh, perplexed, is that uh, the code pen examples that we were using in the verified fetch blog post, they were working fine, but they didn't have the version pinned. And when the sessions code went in, they started behaving really weird and like doing all sorts of request loops and just like inconsistent behavior that we couldn't even re really reproduce locally. And then we basically found out that it's somehow, we don't exactly know how, but it's related to how ESM.sh, the CDN, gives you a dependency and how the browser um, loads it. 
Yeah. And the look on my face was because of the the regularity at which people are able to construct the most insane Rube Goldberg machines to just run some JavaScript in a browser. <laughs> I think the big benefit that ESM.sh brings is that they they can allow you to import like non ESM things uh, in like module code. And so, but yeah, it's weird that it doesn't just work for packages that are ESM. You see, that's landing in Node 22. I, I did see your post about that. Yeah. Thank God. Like, <laughs> Why didn't they do this years ago? Yeah. The amount of issues created. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's so but, basically I mean, it's what not like Alex there's is, any simpler. Sorry. Oh. What Alex is talking about just real quick is is that if you don't use top level awaits in your ESM code, uh you, um you can require your ESM um in ESM module instead of like doing a dynamic import. So CJS, people who are still using CJS, why are you doing so? But also you you will have less pain to, it makes sense why you're doing it. I know some like corporate entities, but um, you can just require the, the ESM packages now. The default settings for TypeScript as well, I think is still to output CJS, which is the worst because it, it looks like you're authoring ESM. You know, like I'm using import. Like, why doesn't it work? And then you know, the actual but they don't output is all CJ. But TypeScript doesn't change your source code. <laughs> uh, it's so funny. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what were you gonna say, Daniel? Oh yeah, I was just going to ask. Like, is there any simpler way to import the code into the browser, like npm published code? Without um, using a bundler ahead of yeah. time. JS deliver. Didn't you say using JS deliver it just works? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So it, I mean, JS deliver does the, the thing. Yeah. What is okay? Yeah, this is actually namespacing the things, and then okay, definitely yeah, looks I mean, different. These, like these services are just bundling your code on the fly, right? So instead of you sitting there and doing it with the S build or whatever, they're just doing it for you. Like it's. Yep. The There's a bundler somewhere. You can't. You just can't get away from it. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it's it'd be like if with C plus plus or Go, if you're like, oh yeah, I just want to import this file. Like, well, you need to build it, right? You need to compile it, um, and it's kind of the same thing, right? Makes sense. Okay. Um. So yeah, before we started recording. Or anything else on that one, Daniel? You wanna you wanna talk about before we move on? Let's move on. Okay. So yeah, before we started recording, we were talking about the sessions and um and and that's kind of related to this one here. We thought that sessions were were breaking that. I think it was just the de the dependencies and how they changed that that broke it. Uh, uh, the code pin examples, um, but. Yeah, we were talking about how sessions work, and I think it's it's worth diving into um, the abstract session code um, for how this works. So basically, like when when a session is created, um, we create we we essentially send off a request for uh, the CID, um, and then. We start finding providers. We will we will continue looking for providers on the background, but we'll also initially query um, all of the providers, and that's done here. Like immediately, we we any of the providers we have already, we'll just start querying them, and then as we find new providers, we add them to the session and query them as well. Um, 
And so providers in this circumstance, we do have a HTTP uh, gateway provider or trustless HTTP trustless gateway provider. I don't think it's named like that. I forget the exact name right now. Um, but those are like your default gateways that you would use with Helio Verified Fetch. And so um, like when we find providers, we we check if we already have that provider. And if we don't, then uh, we dispatch that provider, which goes back to this uh, listener here to add it to the session um, and query that provider. And basically all of the providers that are that are that we're querying, do I have it here? Yeah, that's implement implemented by either the bit swap um, session or trustless gateway session block broker. Um, yeah, then then we start racing them, and then whenever any of them return, and they should emit this success event, and then we found the block and we resolve like those results based on the first person that returns. Um, I have been deep like diving into this issue for for the last few days and having a lot of trouble in a testing environment getting getting this to getting this to work um if i just use helia verified fetch 1.3.13 the gateway conformance test pass everything works as expected but with any later version if i disable sessions or enable sessions even you know allowing local and allowing secure it's not like fetching the block and and working properly. So I feel like we have some bug in our in our session code or in even when sessions aren't being used, we have some bug that we need to figure out. And I've been mostly looking at this from the high level of um, verified fetch and the gateway conformance tests. So like diving down deep into the Helia packages um, has proven troublesome, but I think there's there's a few things that um where's there's a few things that I think are going on here. Uh I'm gonna have to dive in here. I got way too many freaking tabs open. Have you managed to just isolate the difference in behavior? Like what the test expects to happen and what is actually happening. So the the test for the gateway conformance is um dependent on getting the block so like the the kubo like gateway that we're running locally provides the block and then like the problem is is that the verif verified fetch isn't or helia trustless gateways aren't ever saying that they found the block even though i've seen some uh logs that say hey we found the block um like uh in in the where is it at this is going to be in the different um okay yeah it's going to be in block brokers block brokers source trustless gateway and then session so so yeah i see this line here got block and then i end up see, like and then the session ends up continuing to just Query, query, query. Um, but you said that you still saw a failure even if you disabled um, sessions. So that code wouldn't be run then, but you're still seeing the failure. Correct, correct. So when, um, I can't remember right now, I keep I keep going back to the session code to try and get that working. So what, what happens when I disable sessions? I mean, I can... I can um uh I think there's a few there's a few issues that are that are at play here. Um a few different issues. Let me see. Uh, ba, ba, ba. So I just disabled sessions. It just built it. So except header. It's, this is some console log that I added, but yeah. And then it, it kind of just hangs. Um, there's, I've, I've touched so much different things. It's really hard to keep isolated on one because 
um, IPFS D control was updated, uh, Kubo RPC client was updated. And so I tried updating those to the latest to see if that was the issue because I couldn't get this Kubo instance to be using the um, actual repo URL that I passed with the old version. So I updated, so it's using the latest version um, and, and is actually like initializing that Kubo repo where I want it to, because that's where I'm loading the fixtures, the blocks for the fixtures. Um, but then it kind of just hangs when sessions are disabled. Um, yeah, so there's like, I've been, I've been diving into this and I feel like it's, it's breaking my brain. I've just, I haven't found like a step to like isolate the portions so that I can dive into this and actually get it fixed. I keep bouncing around too many things, I think. Um, but I think one one issue that I saw is like this code here, I'm concerned that this, um, like we're doing fine providers. Above this, we're clearing uh, evicting providers and then we're doing fine providers again. And I feel like that is causing an infinite loop in the local, in the, well, like when sessions are enabled, because we're not we're not checking on the result of this at all. We're just deleting the existing request and then calling retrieve again. And I think that was intentional because you wanted people to expi explicitly like abort the the request uh, or the signal. Well, it'll keep it'll keep trying to find providers until it either finds the block. Or the request is aborted. Yeah. I think we can abort earlier though. Like we can say, hey, failed request. If if because like in the testing environment, there should only be one provider. I did actually write um I customized the Helia HTTP um node and passed my own routing provider that only returned the local gateway. And then it's still just endlessly going so i don't think that it's i like this has i thought it was that the has provider wasn't working properly um because i was continuing to get found new providers but i think it's due to this code up here because as soon as it's idle as soon as the request is idle if we haven't found the block and the signal's not aborted we're gonna we're gonna delete it and just call find providers again, no matter what. And I feel like we should be able to say like, await on new providers here somehow. Well, that, I mean, that is what that will do, though, right? Because it will, you, you await on find providers. So you find providers and then resolve the promise. Okay, yeah, and then find providers. It awaits the find providers. It'll just continue, and then assuming that we only stay here, it'll throw right, so this. It returns error. that. It returns that deferred promise. Right? Yeah. So it resolves that promise on line two three nine after it's found providers. Should we be deferred? No, this will catch this error and then deferred reject. Okay, yeah. So so yeah, yeah, I feel like so that, this these aren't being triggered then, like somehow. I don't know. It's really hard to test. I could use some some like one on one time maybe just to dive through this better. But um, but yeah, do you have any recommendations for now on? like how to set up a testing environment for this, this session code. Um, gateway conformance. Well, I mean, but you said that like, even if you turn sessions off, it still failed. Mm -hmm. So the, this might be a red herring. Like I would look into like, you just take the, the simplest case and then see where that test is hanging. And it might not, you know, if you manage to remove all the session code from the equation and the test still failed, then, you know, it should, it should 
be able to pass without all of this stuff because you're just using the um you know the default block broker like thing where you have the the local kubo node hard coded and you're like you're using as a recursive gateway so you're always going to that and if that's still yeah. failing then like that's you know it could be where the problem is i feel like it's related to the the delic the routing is um like giving us network requests with other tests it's giving us like remote peers and then we're querying those and other tests um and there's these gateway conformance cids aren't really provided by anybody else so i feel like the problem that i'm having is is forcing helia to use only local providers like not I mean, like she... don't do any network requests right i mean you know. You know, you see if you if you specify the gateways for the for the providers and the HTTP gateway routing, then it doesn't use public ones. It just uses whatever you've handed it. Right? Yeah. So you know, double check you're doing that because you shouldn't. Right. It shouldn't be making any requests outside of the local machine during testing. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'll dive into that. Okay. Yeah. Keep like also if the if the like for the for the session bear, if the if the session implementations can't find providers, they should throw. Right. right. It shouldn't just be like, oh, I'm just gonna look for more providers. I know I looked and I couldn't find them, so game over. Right. That finding providers method throws and then in the catch the, the deferred promise is rejected and then further up where uh, find providers was invoked. It's in a try catch as well, and if if that if find providers throws, then you just give up. Yeah, this rejects, and then yeah, this deferred this is, like, is this root one. Yeah, yeah. So let's go let's go down back down to where you invoke find new providers. So then yeah, on yeah, there you go. Line one hundred twenty eight, it rejects the deferred promise. Yeah. So, the providers can so you can give up trying to find providers so yeah you either find mm -hmm. the block the request is cancelled or or the session implementation says i can't i can't find it give up okay but if you can isolate the session stuff get rid of it from the test and just use the recursive gateway block broker or you know then uh Yeah. Kind of find where the, where the thing is. Yeah. At first, I thought it was the gateway conformance, like library was updated because the, the like, um, content wasn't being fetched, but diving in it deeper, like, told me that wasn't true. I need to get, I need to, like, initialize the, it'd be nice if the gateway conformance just listed all the CIDs they use. I'm sure I could, like, output the gateway conformance car and get that, get that um but i need to that like yeah i need to instantiate I, need to, I want to see hayden's demo we have to yeah we have to like move along we've only got 25 minutes left yep yeah uh real quick before we hop into that um real quick with the ipfsd control we don't have the controller api gateway host and gateway port anymore um, do you know how we're intended to get that with the latest code, Alex, or did you look into that at all when you updated it? Does it not report an HTTP address? It, I didn't see anything and the node info doesn't have it. It just has the API uh, endpoint. Yeah. API.id, you know, it's just an identify in the, the, like the equivalent of running IPFS ID. Okay. So we call it ID. It returns you the you know the peer address, the support protocols, and all the multi edit. There should be an HTTP multi edit in there that's running the gateway. Okay, and then we'll do multi adder to URI. Okay. Okay. I figured there was something I was missing there. Okay. Um. We can skip that one and go straight into the Helio UI. Cool. Yeah, I think we chatted about that. Hayden, you, you want to show us the demo? Yeah, sure. I'll just uh, 
share my screen. That's it. You seen that? Yep. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's it there. It was pretty much just the idea is to capture everything as small snippets. It's just vanilla or JS, and it just captures very specific functionality. So start, stop, debugging is just that's all it does. Um, start, stop, Helia, that's all it does. Um, basic discover. Um, uh, details, statistics about, stats about the, the peer. And then... I took Alex's web transport session monitor. I don't know, I probably got some issues with it and I need to work it out some more. But the idea was um, taking stuff that's already created and just bundling it into a snippet that can be imported in or rendered into some kind of control panel. So this is just a sort of a, a series of small snippets rendered into, you know, kind of crappy um, uh, bootstrap-esque interface but the idea is that yeah you can just capture these little vanilla js um, snippets that are investigating certain things to do with helia and then just throwing them all into one page um, so that was kind of where i got to just to kind of build it out very quickly um, over the course of a, a day half a day um, and then, yeah, I guess my plan is just to kind of iterate it on, on it if I'm sort of heading in the right direction. I've just put um, some code up um, here. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll just I'll continue to iterate on it if it's if it's heading in the right direction. Start, stop, debugging, um, just all that kind of stuff. Um, and the start debugging is that is that a hard coded yeah, so, string there? Um, yeah, that's just um, I just call um, debug dot enable the debug dot enable, uh, and then and then I rec I'm required to re refresh the page, reload the page to get it to kick um, the debug into action. Cool. Yeah, that's just uh, local storage dot get item debug, just setting that up, set set item, um, set item debug lib P2P. And if you, I'm not doing that correctly. If you call, if you import the debug library, you can call okay. dot enable on it and it should enable okay. it for like globally live without having to refresh the page. But if you're doing oh, the local oh, really? storage, okay. then it reads that on startup. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what I'd prefer to do. I definitely prefer to uh, to load it up in the existing page rather than having to refresh the page because that's, that's ugly. Can you call the enable, do you know, on the lippy to p logger? Do you have to import the debug one? You got to import the I was debug say, one. No, it's, it's re-exported from, uh, from the p to p logger. Oh. So as long as oh. you've got the same version of the dependency that, that everything else has on the page, then okay, and you can use it. I did not know that. That's good to know. So yeah, lib p2p debugger should export the debug module, and we can just call enable. Oh, uh, straight on the debug no, it, module. It doesn't export debug; it exports enable and disable. Okay. Okay. Just the methods. Okay, got it. Okay, well, I'll incorporate that in then. Oh, yeah. Well, there it is. That's cool. Sweet. Really nice. Yeah. I just looked at the code, Hayden. It's pretty neat how you, like, broke it into little... Uh, yeah, it's rooms. just... Um, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, it's just kind of a had to get a first start but yeah the idea is to um just break it down into small snippets that you can then either import into a full helia browser uh, sorry a helia 
UI, or you could just take various bits and pieces and um, put it into your your existing app to, for example, get a list of peer peer IDs, remote peer IDs. Um, and obviously, it's pretty um, simple at the moment. But the idea is that you can just iterate on the on the different modules um, to add more and more functionality. And uh, what I what I'll probably do is uh, you know, I'm not a designer at all, so what I'll probably do is just put out a call, maybe various communities to just say is there a front-end designer who wants to sort of jump on the Helia UI and make it a bit more um, sophisticated and, and better looking. But um, I think that's that's just kind of a, an afterthought. But um, uh, one thing we were sort of discussing at OrbitDB was also this idea of possibly um, packaging up each of these snippets, and we discussed this a while back, three or four months ago, was to package up the, the different JavaScript snippets and then have them in a database that we could then deliver and you could prog you could almost, I guess, take a copy of the database, it would load up the different snippets that you have available and then you could actually build your own U UI. So um, I don't know if we're sort of investing, that's just using sort of OrbitDB as a snippet delivery, delivery mechanism um, so that you could actually build out your own interfaces. But um, that's, that's something we may, may re revisit as well. But then, on top of this, what you could do is you could write additional snippets that maybe um, query um, information from, for example, OrbitDB or anything that's built on top of Helia and um, incorporate that into your own dashboard. So you might have your Helia dashboard, but it's querying a third-party app that sits on top of Helia and giving you statistics from that app as well as giving you Helia statistics. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love how how isolated those components are. If we if we did um, if those were published and people could import them via npm or even um, yeah. live via Orbit DB, that'd be that sounds super cool. Yeah, yeah, that would be the idea. Is that you could take those packages and you could um, yeah just import what you need from from the the kind of mono repo, but. Um, uh, and this might be a question for Daniel because you're working on the kind of connect the connectivity stuff. Um, one thing I was thinking was is there, you know, is there scope for a snippet whereby um, you could graphically, for example, you want to configure your transports and you could actually graphically tick the bot. I want web transport. I want um, I want relay. I want um, TCP, and it can actually build out the config file for you. So that you could potentially turn on and off. I think, and I think Russell, we were talking about this the other day, the potential to be able to turn on and off, for example, I don't know, transports. So you're yeah, in the Yeah, I guess that's where the going. question came from to like whether you can do that after you've started the leap P2P node. Which yeah, I guess this yeah. is like the hard part because if you can't change it, then that means that every time you change that configuration, you have to restart the leap P2P node. Yeah, that's right. Um, we're, and I don't know if there's a massive downside to that. If you're, you're, you're probably going to come into the Helia node, um, a Helia UE with, um, and using it as a, as a configuration and um, kind of play around tool. You're probably not going to be too worried about it being up, yeah. having good uptime. Um, so if it does involve, oh, look, I want to turn on these or turn off these um, transports, and then I need to restart the node. Um, maybe that's just an additional step that needs to be taken because you're using it um, as kind of a building tool. You're not using it as it needs to be up right now, you know, and it needs good uptime. I think yeah. I think there is a case where somebody, you know, has a long running node and they they don't want to restart it. But I, I don't know that we have very many of those users right now. Um. But yeah, debugging like debugging a live one without having to restart it would be useful. But I don't know that that's as important right now. No, that um, sounds like um, unnecessary additional work. Yeah, I do if think it just made dynamic... it, it starts and stops very quickly, so it's I don't think it's a massive big deal. Yeah, I do think the the dynamic configuration of lib p2p and helia would be would be very cool um but yeah i don't know 
I mean, there's there's all types of things to think about with that. Like if you enable, if you've already discovered hundreds of peers and then you enable TCP, like do we then loop over all of them and do do identify or try to reconnect to different peers that we weren't able to connect with um, that have TCP or, or whatever other transport um, or like enabling enabling auto NAT after the fact doesn't make quite as much sense, I guess. And there's a few other services where that wouldn't make sense, but um, it would be cool to dynamically configure the P2P. I don't know. Have you thought about that at all, Alex? Yeah, there's like this, like some of the, yeah, some of the, some of the config values only make sense at startup and that kind of thing. But there are some, there are some things that we get to be able to do dynamically, like listen on a new address, like stop listening on an old address. Like those things are, are weird that we've never supported those. Yeah. And like for mobile, for the mobile use case, I can see this really coming in handy because if you're hopping different networks and things like that, being able to, to, to update that on the fly um, is going to be yeah. vital. I think for mobile certainly because like if you go from like, uh, you know, from Wi-Fi to to mobile data, you might want to shut down a bunch of services, and then start them up again when you go back onto Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, for data, for saving data too, yeah. Um, if if you, uh, I know the mobile use case isn't, we probably don't have libp2p on mobile too much right now, um, but if you are on Wi-Fi and then you switch to the cellular network, does, does the broadcast addresses, do the broadcasted addresses update, the listening multi-adders? Will they update today? Uh, I don't. They probably won't. No. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's that an would interesting be one because, like, you're only really going to be doing that in like web. Uh, sorry, in um, you know, like React Native. And so you're talking about TCP addresses, and the the React Native TCP module is kind of lacking a bunch of features. Um. It just it needs some time spent on it, really. Cool. That's good to think about. Hopefully coming in the future. But things like relay addresses should continue working. Because you have a you have a connection to the relay and then uh it, sh it should be tagged and then if that connection closes, it should try to redial the relay. And then um, they'll so get the new address. Your... Yeah, and then everything else just kicks in like normal. You know, your um when your when your multi adders change, identify push will notify your connected peers and that kind of thing. So Yeah. Well, All the pieces cool. are there, I think, for that. Cool. Um yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's besides the the item we skipped here, Daniel, but I think we also talked about this a little bit. Um, I think we covered all the agenda items, but do you have anything else you want to chat about with this, Daniel? Um, no, I, 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 I guess the quick question is basically they're done in parallel. Basically, like Helia will try, if you have sessions enabled both, to... Uh, call the delegated routing endpoint and make a call to the recursive gateway. If the recursive, because the recursive gateway is essentially a router of its own, it's just a not a delegated routing. It's a, a, a trustless gateway router, right? So I guess the insight is that unlike block brokers, like the trustless gateway block broker, which does one gateway after the other sequentially and only calls basically another gateway if the first one fails. Here it's parallel, the delegated routing and the um, uh, pre-configured recursive trustless gateway. Yeah? Say like super simple example, you just do verified fetch 
for a seed, right? And you have configured in that when you instantiate verified you fetch, you instantiated it with the trustless gateway and uh, with the whatever, like the delegated routing endpoint. It'll try, when you do the verified fetch call, it'll try both in parallel. It'll make a delegated routing request. It might find providers through that, but in parallel, it will also call the recursive gateway. Yeah. So it, it is a parallel thing, unlike the block broker, like the gateway block brokers. Yeah. So, but I think um, the the first step, regardless now, is that the routing, the routers for Helia is called initially. And then so the HTTP gateway routing will return those hard coded gateways, those recursive gateways um, initially. And then as soon as soon as we get those, that the initial sort of session peers are found, and then we start querying those. And then we're also like calling delegated HTTP routing and, and other routing to to find additional peers to attach to that session. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So basically there's like a, a target number of uh, providers per session that it tries to aim, right? Like I remember it was five, I think. And uh, I think basically that's it'll try. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The max. Um, it'll basically try to, you know, max out on those, um, which means that if you like, if you're using recursive gateway, if the recursive gateway is quick enough, in most cases, it'll just get it from the recursive gateway. Yeah. What's interesting yeah. though is, um, is if you don't pass a recursive gateway, then it will start doing the delegated, you know, uh, content routing and then it will start trying to resolve the peers and like the reality is like for ex like for one of the examples that i was looking at like the vitalik vitalik website like if you look at it now at this code pen it'll just make loads of different calls but eventually it'll just fail um that is without having any gateways so it'll do the, uh, the, what do you call it? Like the IPNS resolution. Well, not the IPNS, like the ENS resolution, right? It'll get like the SID. Um, but it won't actually find any of the providers. And what I, I guess what's interesting there is, I mean, okay, fair enough. Like the delegate routing endpoint isn't successful in resolving those peer IDs to multi-adders. But for the ones that it is, for some reason, it doesn't even try to establish a web transport connection, even though they do have a web transport uh, multi-adder. So, mm -hmm. that's a mouthful. Yeah, like I think a part of this is just the problem that like some guy just uh, for whatever reason isn't uh, doing peer routing properly. It's returning loads of 404s if you look in the network tab, trying to load the uh, multi-adders for these. But some of them are successful. Like if you see, yeah, you see it's lo loads of 404s. But some of them, yeah, there we go. Like the one below that, yeah, exactly. If you look in the preview, you'll see some... Uh, uh, you'll see some, yeah, there you go. There's a web transport and it looks public. Like we expect it to dial it, right? Because it adds the peer to the peer book and it still hasn't found the block. So it's not like there's anything that would stop it from continuing on that. I think if I remember looking at the, the code, um, I think we're just getting the first HTTP address that we find here. Also with verified fetch, um, it does not do bit swap. By default, you have to um, actually pass the, because it uses the Helia HTTP. Um, and so you might uh, see better okay. results without using the gateway by enabling bit swap block broker. Right. 
That begs the question, are there any peers that actually do return an HTTP multi-adder? Because if not, I don't think there's any point in calling all of these, making all of these calls. Huh? There are, but it's not like lots. Yeah. That's why the, the HTTP gateway routing falls back to just the recursive gateway. Yeah. Yeah, it's like... Uh, the hope is that in the future there'll be more. It's aspirational. Um, yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, I wonder, um, it might be worth adding in um, BitSwap here. If we do add the BitSwap block broker to just Helia HTTP, that won't just work, right? We'd need to actually pass the Helia non-HTTP. Well, I mean, you can still pass all the same config to the regular Helia that you pass to Helia HTTP. Yeah. You know, you can still have the HTTP routing, the block, you know, the trusses gateway block brokers, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, the only difference is you get to... the P2P and BitSwap too. Yeah. I just wanted to correct because I initially said you just pass BitSwap to the Helia HTTP, but but yeah, you would want the yeah, non HTTP. Yeah. Actually... yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then in theory, we would start like trying to dial those web transport multi adders and then, you know, doing bit swap over that web transport session and bam. Yeah. Those blocks. It would be cool to even just try to get a demo, even if it's just for IPFS camp to like, you know, kind of like show what the future golden path looks like. I mean, granted, if you want to do everything in JavaScript today with like Helio and JS Lippy to be, you can't really enjoy like the benefits of like, say, web transport just yet, because you can't do like web transport. Maybe use so Firefox, you, like... you can. No, no, I mean, like, no JS, brain. you can't do web transport. So you have to like get a yeah, certificate. You have TCP. You right, can but you can't dial that from the browser. If you want to do like an end-to-end -end example can... where a browser is just finding your Node.js process that you just started, say, five minutes ago, and Verified Fetch just magically calls a delegated routing endpoint, and, you know, the DHT was working fine, and the delegated routing endpoint found your Node.js process, but then the browser can't dial it because, well, we don't have web transport in Node.js. Yeah, you'll need to do some additional configuration. Or you have your node, uh, your node node listen on WebRTC, and have a dialer. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And then you can have the interesting, you can have an interesting aside where you point out that you have configured WebSockets with a with an SSL certificate, and nginx, and then you've had the node node use itself as a circuit relay via its own WebSocket uh, transport, which the browser can then dial and then make a WebRTC connection to the node. And... Oh, because it still needs the circuit relay, even if it's node. In the, yeah, in the absence of WebRTC signaling. direct, you need a relay. Yeah. I think my head just... I did see someone, somebody uh, put a PR into a libdata channel that removes the check for uh for the like the fingerprint check which is one of the prerequisites for enabling WebRTC direct or being able to support it which is quite cool and not quite i can't quite remember what else needs to be done there but like, in lib um, data channel yeah so it's the so we use node node data channel um, to do, which is the, the JavaScript bindings for lib data channel, which is a C++ implementation of WebRTC data channel. So that's what we use to do the WebRTC transport. So somebody opened a pull request here? Your reminder from last Not to this one. This is the node bindings. So it's the C, the underlying C library, which is lib data channel. What impact will that have on on us? 
like no data data channel we won't, we won't need to do handshakes it's this one so in order to implement uh so the difference between webrtc direct and webrtc private to private is that webrtc private to private needs the circuit relay to do the the stp handshake webrtc direct does not so you can dial it directly hence the name um, but in order to, but you still need to do the handshake, right? That's how WebRTC works. You need to, you need to exchange your ICE candidates in order to do, like to, you know, to work out how you're going to connect. Um, and and Web, what WebRTC Direct does is it, it it does what do you call it? It's like header munging, like SDP header munging. So you, there's like a there's like a field that you can set that um, you send your certificate fingerprint in. Which then allows the remote to to then like guess what the rest of the the handshake would be. Um, yeah, and so we needed to remove a few bits and pieces from lib data channel to do it, which has now been done, which is cool. Um, but I think there might be some other things that need to happen by the middle of the minute. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Apropos WebRTC, can I share my screen? Unless like you have something in particular, yeah. like, just something quick I was working on yesterday. Yeah. So yesterday, uh, while I was working on the browser connectivity guide, I was like, okay, like I'm going to read the spec and like, I'm going to do a sequence diagram. It's my chance to learn Mermaid JS finally. And so I was like, bam. And I don't know, I think I've got something decent. I might even submit this as a PR through the WebRTC spec because basically it's based on it. Even You're though sharing Slack bit... right now, just so you know. Say again? You're sharing Slack. Ah, okay. Whoops. It wasn't Let's anything. It was the public channel, so. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. This should be the oh, one. Cool. Yeah. Anyways, just a sequence diagram, um, but it's, so it's really useful. I don't understand why people don't get it. It's so simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is not simple. Who designed this thing? I mean, it's... it's kind of twisted it, genius, obviously. <laughs> it's magic that this works at all. Anyways, I also spent a little bit of time like looking at different kinds of NAT because I was kind of surprised that NAT hole punching is working in the first place. Um, but uh, it seems like, uh, I mean, at least the networks that I was trying it on, it was working well. This is, I'm talking about the universal connectivity app, which makes use of the whole process. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we should, um, are you going to, add this to the universal connectivity repo, the diagram? Uh, it was actually more for the browser guide. Um, but but I, I might just submit it to the spec, but it just I know that the gatekeepers are quite um, pedantic about what goes into the lib P2P specs. So I'm not sure if it's like up to standard, um, but yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, the diagram guide for, for how the spec, I mean, it makes sense that they would have a diagram to like display things, um, you know, visually as to what actually is happening. So, and it at least be a good place to verify that you know the diagram is is accurate. All right. But that's cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, we are at time, so uh, I'm gonna close up shop here. Unless anybody has any last minute items they want to mention. No. Okay. Alrighty. Well, have a great day, everybody. Uh, see you uh, next time on the Helio Working Group. Peace. Thanks.